Welcome back to the Mind of Watercolor, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well out there. Excuse the hoarseness in my voice. Had a little bit of a chest congestion this week. Been a little under the weather, but it's not bad. Uh, it will make me sound a little froggy though. What we're gonna talk about today is palettes. I, I've been wanting to do this episode for a while. The, uh, it's been since the first year of me doing YouTube that I've done an episode on palettes. And I thought it's high time I did another one. Palettes are one of those things that uh, can overwhelm you. And yet it's also one of those things that's very, very personal. It's hard to make a mistake doing a palette and it really has to do with your own personal preferences, the way you like to paint. And honestly, it may take you a while to figure out what those are. I have experimented extensively with palettes. I feel like I'm still experimenting. There's not a palette that I have or a way of paletting paint that I have that hasn't worked, that literally just does not work. There are some that work better than others. There are things that work better in certain circumstances. But what I wanna talk about today is how to stay flexible, um, especially for you who like to collect paint, maybe over time, like to collect a lot of paint. You know, if you buy six, 10, 12 colors, and that's it, you know, you're pretty much done for a while, then it's a simple solution. If, if however, uh, you really don't know what colors, you're willing to try some, you're willing to try others, you need to stay more flexible. And trust me, you know, with all of the paint that I've reviewed and tried, uh, flexibility has always been a key uh, issue on my mind. So what I wanna do is just take you along my journey, just take you along with the uh, palettes I've used, observations I've made about them, things that I have found useful. And the first thing I wanna talk about is cataloging your colors. Even if you only have maybe 10 to 12 colors to start or, or less, I would start doing this if you plan to get more. Most people just even will get bored with colors and want to try new colors. Some artists don't. They just they settle into a palette and that's what they use forever and ever. And that's fine. I, any way you want to do it is fine. I do suggest that if you're going to get a lot of colors or going to get more colors that you catalog them. First of all, make a diagram and a swatch of every palette that you have if you have a palette we'll talk about that more later but this kind of chart is really really important if you're going to have more than one palette especially or just to at a glance be able to see what the colors are this is a swatch chart of my m Graham studio palette probably my most used palette right now i'm pretty familiar with these colors but until you become so or if you switch palettes a good bit some of these colors may be difficult to tell what they are. So I always have this nearby when I'm doing a painting. I usually stand it up over in the corner as I'm painting, just in case I need to glance at it. More about these palette styles in a minute. Uh, just talking more about cataloging your colors. This is a very useful way. And these are about training car size. And I did a waffle flower stamp review. I'll put a link to it down there where you can stamp this information, but you don't need to do that. You can draw out your own. Uh, I like this though for cataloging your colors, especially as you add colors and maybe not every color is on every palette or you're going to make multiple palettes. This is a great thing to do is to, to make individual uh, swatch cards. One thing I like about this as your collection builds, you can kind of like deal yourself a palette. It also uh, will help you lay out a palette i've done this a couple times it's, it's like how you want to position the wells say okay there's an eight color palette and i'm going to position them that way by the way i'm doing this randomly so don't say these are eight colors i recommend um it's it's a great way to carry with you if you go to the paint store just to remind myself what i have i'll take this brand okay it, just a lot of advantage to, to having these and just to carry it a step further you can even bind them together. I, I like this disc binding system. You can put them in a, in a binder with sleeves, like trading card sleeves. That's one way. I like these, this disc binding system. Uh, if you're not familiar with disc binding, it requires you to buy a punch. So uh, it may be something that you don't want to spend the money on. Um, I actually bought a disc binding system to make some watercolor journals. I found I liked it better even for this. Basically, you buy these discs, you buy a punch, it punches little holes like this. They can come in and out, you can rearrange them. I have my paint stored by brand. 
I can throw this in the box with them. Just a lot of ways you can treat the trading cards. So before we get into the pallets, I wanted to talk about that. Just uh, every pallet that you fill, I recommend you do this. Even their little ones. Now let's talk about the pallets themselves. Things to think about and ways of keeping all of this flexible. So, uh, my first pallet that I ever had was very similar to this. Uh, it was a John Pike pallet. I've gotten rid of it since. Um, after 40 plus years, it had yellowed so bad, I didn't want to use it anymore. Uh, I bought another one. This is actually the John Pike Big Well palette. Uh, I wanted to put a, together a palette for big brushes, uh, or one that you could easily use bigger brushes with. This palette has about the biggest wells out there. There's another one out there that I don't have by Sterling Edwards called the Big Well palette. Uh, because he uses a lot of big brushes. I'll list it below, but I've, I've never tried it. But if you're interested in a big brush palette, it may be an option too. But I love John Pike's palettes, and it does take them quite a long time to yellow, I will say. Plastic, I think, eventually yellows. But I use this palette because my first watercolor teacher recommended it. It had a whole nother surface here you could use to mix. Big brushes, big washes, great for big painting. For normal day-to-day -day studio use, I started moving away from these bigger palettes just because of, of desk space. So that's always a consideration when you're getting a palette. Number one, the size of brushes you're most likely to use. If you're going to use bigger or smaller brushes, the amount of mixing area that you want, and the amount of desk space that you have. Now I don't necessarily consider the colors. Uh, the number of colors because even if I'm starting with 12 I would get a palette like this and that's what I want to talk about is keeping that flexible so when I had a palette like this before I had a mix of high quality artist grade paint and student grade paint I didn't pay a lot of attention to the quality of my paint when I started to think more intently about the quality of my supplies and I sort of went back to square one on learning watercolor I decided to completely upgrade all my paint to artist quality paint. That's when I discovered M. Graham. So let me show you how that journey went. First of all, I set this palette aside and I started doing this. And if you're a beginner or you're just getting into watercolor, these ceramic plates are great. I picked these up at Target, usually five bucks each, maybe seven for bigger plates. I started out with M. Graham. I didn't know anything about M. Graham. And I have several colors on this palette now, but I only started with maybe three or four, just to decide if I like the paint, how it was going to do. As I got more paint, you know, I just picked up more plates because they were cheap. I like the open palette kind of configuration. I mean, this these plates here are probably uh, 15 years old. They clean off to perfect white. They don't yellow the way uh, plastic does. But it's flexible. It's a great way to build your collection, try out new paints. Even today, I will use these plates to do a uh, painting in a limited color scheme, maybe one that includes colors I don't have on another palette. As my colors grew, I went to palettes like this. This is ceramic also, very heavy, very large. Uh, this is an enamel butcher tray. Both of these act similarly in that they will clean back to pure white. These are great if you don't have a lot of colors but you like big washes. I still like this one a lot when I'm doing big washes and larger paintings. I will usually pull out this palette or this one. The one drawback to these is that paint tends to pool and run along the edge so you'll get it running together a bit. I don't really find that a problem since I do a lot of mixing anyway. It's easy to pull out a pure color into the center if you need it to. So this is a great option. And in the early years, this was all very flexible. It helped me in building my collection and staying flexible and spending more time considering what colors I wanted to use or not use. As I became more familiar, I started looking towards building a smaller studio well palette again. So over the years, I kind of became familiar with what I liked, what I was going to use more often. And I started putting together this studio palette that I showed you earlier. Smaller, made a little better use of uh, table space, still had a good bit of mixing area, still had a lid I could mix in if I wanted to. Plenty of flexibility there. So uh, one of the features that I really like in a studio palette is 
the deep well at the back with the ramp up towards the front. Actually, this is even higher than I normally prefer, but I, I've gotten used to it. This is what I really prefer, a very low ramp in the front. And the only reason I'm not using this is because of the size. I'm building a collection of Da Vinci and Daniel Smith, and I may either, either do a mixed brand or uh, a single brand, like say Daniel Smith for this big well palette. I'm not sure yet. This has been a good palette though. This is a Magello palette. I will list it below too. And it's been very flexible and the size has been fine for most studio painting. All right, so that brings us to about five years ago when I started my YouTube channel. And I started bringing in other brands and trying them. The, f the first artist grade brand that I tried after M. Graham was Core. And that's because Golden sent me some samples. So I started building a core collection. I went to a slightly smaller, you can see the trend is, is getting smaller. Uh, love this palette. This is a Fusion palette. It'll be sold under other brand names, but I think it's a Magello Fusion palette. I actually have another one that I haven't filled yet. I'm still deciding what I'm going to put in here. I like the fact that it has this removable tray. I'm not sure why I like that fact, but I do like it. <laughs> Also, as uh, my YouTube channel progressed, I got interested in trying plein air. I hadn't done a lot of plein air up to that point, and I decided to. This was my first plein air palette. This little, uh, I think it was like five bucks. This is still a really good palette. I mean, take a look at these nice little wells. They have low ramps like I like. Pretty good mixing area, at least for plein air. Not bad as a supplemental palette if you want to pull it out. And we'll talk about supplemental palettes. That's a whole nother concept in a minute. But still, as a thumb hold if you want to use it standing up. It really is a good, inexpensive way to go from this evolution. You know, you start building your collection, putting out a few paints, trying a few. Maybe get another dish, try a few more. Put together limited color schemes. As you think you might have an idea for a palette on Amazon, these are like less than four bucks each and they really really are, are not bad palettes you could have uh four or five of these and stack them on your bookshelf like books really good way to go if you're wanting to go cheap i have not found anything wrong with this palette right here but inevitably a lot of artists like to go bigger so they go with something like this or eventually something like this or even something like this but i mean honestly you can see how anxious i've been to fill this not very so I hope you see where my evolution has gone here. And as I got into learning more about plein air and doing plein air, naturally the metal paint box comes into play. This was my first metal paint box with standard half pan. Now for those of you just getting into watercolor don't know anything, a half pan is a standard pan. These uh, metal boxes, the pans clip in, you can swap them out, that makes them flexible. You can buy empty half pans and fill them yourself. You can buy, buy pre-filled half pans. This was a pre-filled set. A half pan is half of a full pan. Here is a full pan set that I have with uh, four half pans up here. So you can put together um, a full pan set or a mixed set of half pans and full pans. The drawback to these for me were mixing surfaces. The, biggest, the other biggest drawback besides mixing sides for me on palettes like this, I don't like uh, not having a ramp like this. Now this holds as about as much paint as a full pan. I like these ramps for pulling out and I like the mixing area butting up right to all the paint wells. That's the advantage of a studio palette. A lot of plein air painters will, will take this kind of palette with them. They have a way to attach it to their easel. This holds even bigger amounts of paint and I just love the fact that uh, it's easy to pull paint into those areas. Here it's not so easy. You got to pick up the paint and place it over in the mixing area. The other advantage I find with metal boxes in the field is I use magnetic clips, magnetic stabiliz stabilization on my easel. It works really well. I can clip these to sketchbooks or to my easel. Great as a portable solution, not my favorite as a studio solution. Great as a flexible solution for switching out paints. So pros and cons of both. Now, as we're talking about pans and half pans, I'm still working on this. This is fairly new. This is a Meaden uh, palette. This is a 36 color palette, plastic. I am not using this as a palette really, but as a storage container. This holds 36 half pans. I bought this as a storage solution. And as I get other colors and may want to put them in half pans that I can switch out with these, 
I will start filling this in uh, as a storage case for half pans. That's the theory anyway. Chronic experimenter, that's who I am. And it's helpful at being a palette because I can test the colors over here if I want to. But I will not probably, maybe, but probably will not paint with this palette or from this palette. Just want to show you another studio palette that I have. I, I bought this for Renaissance. Again, a different style I wanted to try, but I really like this palette. This is a metal palette. I don't remember the brand. I will look it up and put a link to it. Uh, it's pretty good uh, quality. It's got a thumb hole if you want to stand to paint, but I just like the large size of the, the pans for the relative small size of the palette. It's a bigger palette I could take into the field if I want to. Mixing areas could be bigger, but then I would have a bigger palette. So and it's about the same size as my core palette, the Fusion palette. So if you like a metal palette, that's a good option. Now, as we're talking about flexibility, here's the recommendation I want to make to you. For those of you who are just building your collection, only have a few colors, as you maybe try this and start to go towards one of these, um, don't be afraid of getting, uh, this is I think a 26 color one. Yeah, this is a 26 color palette. If you have only six colors, that's fine. Uh, space them out. This is done a lot by, by artists who buy new palettes and have a limited number of colors to put them. I like to arrange my colors from warm to cool. You know, usually greens through yellows, through reds, red browns, through purples into blues and neutrals. But you can still space them out. If you had eight colors or ten colors, you may have five on this side and five on this side. Just space them out. And as you get new colors, you can fill in. That's great for palettes like this that don't have the same flexibility as half pans, but where you want something that's more studio. Here's another palette I bought, um, sort of on a whim. This is the Bulletproof Glass Palette from Magello. It's just a beautiful, beautiful palette. The impracticality for me, that's why I haven't filled it yet, is it's only uh, average size wells. So if I'm gonna have a palette this big and you know unfolded, it's really as big as this big well palette. So uh, if real estate on your desktop's a problem, this takes up a lot, but it holds 36 colors. So that's great. The other thing I don't like about it, if you have colors that run, you're gonna need to make sure this palette completely dries before you fold it up, because you see what happens. That's usually not a problem if it's a studio palette, because you've done painting, you can leave it out. Now, what I wanna talk about a little bit is supplements supplementing palettes, which is a simple way to go. You know, I mentioned this palette and how flexible this is, given how cheap it is. It has a decent sized well. It's not very big. It would be easy to have two of these out, and it wouldn't take up much more room than one of these. It'd be less room than one of these. And this holds 20 colors, so uh, with two of these out on your surface, you know, you've got 40 colors. Really good and expensive option. So, and you could set up like primaries or a certain range of colors in this palette and then maybe an alternate set that you use less in another one and just bring it out and supplement it. Or maybe for two styles of painting, florals or portraits, landscape over here, who knows? Or blues and greens in ones and reds and yellows in the other, you know? So thinking in terms of supplementing palettes is something I've been thinking a lot about. Uh, I still love this. I think this is still one of the best ways to supplement a palette quickly and flexibly. Again, just putting out little bits of paint. This is the uh, Daniel Smith Primatex set that I was testing. And I, I have several of these plates, so I just pull one of these out. And most of it's been used up. But if I were want to supplement a palette or something I'm working on with Primatex, I could pull this out and easily do that. You can do that with with box sets, combine any two. Really, uh, it's just, when I mean, you start thinking in terms of flexibility, you don't have to set up the one be all, end all palette, you know, that has all the colors in it that you normally use. You don't have to think that way. Think flexibly. I, I've been forced to because of my channel and the way I review paints, but I thought I would pass some of those thoughts along for you to get you thinking. If you're still developing your color collection and how you paint what palettes you want to use.
Many of you may remember the uh, interview I did with Maria Coriel Martin, Expeditionary Art. She makes these little bitty palettes. Great for having the small, probably the smallest, one of the smallest <laughs> plein air palettes out there. But they don't have to be for plein air. This is a great little supplementary palette you're painting in your studio. You could have, grab a couple of these and, and put colors in there that you might want to add to another palette. You don't have to paint outside to use one of these. Not only that, but these are magnetic, so you could rearrange them. If you had a couple of these as supplementary palettes, rearrange them. She sells all different sides of pans. I'll link to that review if you haven't seen it. And now she's got a smaller one even than that. It's about half the size. For <laughs> really, really tiny palette. All right, you getting tired of all these options yet? So uh, you may remember this if you saw my Christmas gift episode last year. Uh, this is the Cloverleaf paint box. Something that, again, I hope to do a full review on. I really like the concept of it, just haven't had a chance to really put it into use. What I like about this box is how compact it is versus how much uh, total mixing area there is. Just huge, larger than full pan pans, and just a ton of mixing area for something that folds up so compact. So that's what it's got going for it. And this is the reason I wanted to show it with the idea of flexibility in mind and supplementing other palettes in mind or even supplementing this one. This could easily be your main palette, 13 colors, but the uh, paint tray lifts out. By the way, this is, uh, I hope to do a palette picks episode on this. This is the Alvaro Castanet Daniel Smith set. And I particularly put it out in here because I also wanted to try this palette out, but I'm gonna at some point do a palette picks on uh, this set, this Daniel Smith set. But you can also buy the paint boxes separately as a case without all four mixing clover leaves. You can buy just this, which will hold two additional cases. So you can uh, buy one of these just as a case for extra paint or color selections, which is pretty neat actually. So that's almost 40 colors. Just use Set up a basic palette if you want, whip out one of these extra ones with additional colors when you need them. Just another option. These are sold, I think, through Jackson's, but also in the U.S. through uh, an Etsy dealer, I believe. Although I think they even those come from the U.K., I forget. All right, something new I haven't tried yet, but I'm anxious to. Always enjoy getting a package from Adventurous Art Supply. This is another Etsy dealer. She, she deals in a lot of uh, little mini palettes, uh, novelty palettes. It's always fun though getting a package from her. It's packaged up in these, these topographical maps. So let me show you what I, what I got going on here. And here's how I decided I'm gonna supplement some palettes. She's got these little sets that are magnetic. You can fill them with additional colors, that kind or this kind. So when you want to supplement a palette, let's say I'm going out on location with this palette, boom, supplemented with five extra colors. You could put gouache in there, just whatever you can think of. I, I, I just think it's, it's a really cool idea. Oh, and by the way, if you want to put them on a ceramic or a plastic palette, you can add the magnetic strips to some part of that palette and extend your ceramic or plastic palettes that way. So here's what I plan to do with two of these. The set comes with six, three of this kind, and three of this kind. Oh, I didn't notice there's like two different ones. There's egg shaped and then there's these little round shaped ones. So we actually have three different types. That's cool. For a while now, I've been wanting to put together a grade colors palette. So I've got eight colors that I've picked out. Several of them are from the new Daniel Smith grays. Jane's Gray, love that, it's a nice transparent, similar to Payne's Gray. Soda Light Genuine, now this is a similar hue, it's a little bluer than Jane's Gray, but it has extreme granulation, which I love. Moon Glow, which uh, reminds me a lot of M. Graham's Neutral Tint, has a, but it has an even more violet cast to it. Alvaro's Caliente Gray. So those four I'm gonna put on one of these. And on another one, I'm gonna put these gray colors. Great Titanium, Perlene Violet, Daniel Smith, uh, Da Vinci's Indigo, which is a pretty nice subdued blue, and Perlene Green. So now I've got uh, four grade colors, and that'll go on one of these. So that'll be fun. We'll see how that works. 
anyway thank you everybody i hope uh that little foray into my palette history and my observations on palettes hope that gives you something to think about feel free to ask questions about what i think about whatever on these palettes i'll try to answer them thank you so much patrons for sponsoring this channel making all this content possible we'll see everybody in the next video bye bye